morning. Once again, my name is David. I have the honor of serving as one of the pastors here. We're gonna be spending a few minutes together in God's word. So if you have your Bible today, I'm gonna ask you to turn to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. And we're gonna be looking at verses 13 and 14. And we're continuing in a series that we've titled, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And while you turn there today, I want to look right in the cameras and just say again to our online church how much we love you. We're so glad that you are tuning into service today. Uh, we believe God's got something special for you. And please know our heart is, is that if you've never been in the building before, we hope one day you can make it here. Or if you haven't been in a while, we'd love to see you again soon. Isn't that right, church? Can we show some love to our online church today? We we love you so much. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in today. Like I mentioned, we've been in a series titled, Who is Jesus? Working through Colossians chapter one, looking at some key verses and words and phrases that give us insight into who Jesus is. How many of you know, if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, it's important that we know who he is. And then it's also important that we know what he has to say about us as his followers. And so we've covered a variety of different topics. And today we're continuing in verses 13 and 14. And if you have your Bible today, you can join me in reading it. If you don't, it'll be right on the screens. And if you haven't downloaded our app yet, I want to encourage you to do that. New Life Lehi. Search it in your app store. You can follow along with sermon notes. You can check out previous messages from this series and other series that we've done. You can give, check out events. I encourage you to download it, New Life Lehi. All right, Colossians 1, verses 13 through 14. For he, being God, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption. Everyone say redemption. The forgiveness of of sins. Today, for the next few moments, we're going to focus on that word, redemption. What does it mean that Jesus is our redeemer? What does it mean that we've been offered redemption in him? But before we do that, would you join me in prayer? And let's ask that God would speak to our hearts today. Father, we love you and we thank you for these moments we are spending today together in God's word. And we ask that you'll speak to us. Holy Spirit, Give us eyes to see and give us ears to hear what you're wanting to say to us today, that we would encounter your son, Jesus, and that we would leave here forever changed by your power and presence. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray these things. And all God's people said... Amen. So we're focusing on this word redemption today because Paul, who is writing this letter, this is actually a letter written to a church. He's writing this letter and he's encouraging believers. And as we flowed through this letter, we've seen there's been encouragements, uh, there's been corrections about misconceptions in their faith. And here he takes a moment to remind them in the verses prior of the importance of growing in their relationship with God, of the importance of seeking the will of God for their life. But then he reminds them that because they are children of God, they have access to what the children of God have access to, and that's only because in Jesus they've been redeemed. In Jesus, they've been given redemption. So I Googled the word redemption and, and just a definition that you can keep in your mind and carry with you today. It's redemption means the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. The action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. Paul here is reminding the Colossians that you were bought at a price. Those of you that are followers of Jesus, those of you that have received that gift of salvation, it came as a gift to you, but Jesus paid a price for it. You've been redeemed from the power of sin because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You've been redeemed. And so because Paul thought it right to focus on redemption, we're going to take the next few minutes and focus on it. And I have three thoughts I want you to carry with you today. And the first one is this. We're going to focus in on Jesus, our loving Redeemer. If it's in Jesus that we're offered redemption, then it's only right that we begin by focusing on him our Redeemer. And you'll notice there that I tagged on the word loving to Redeemer because I believe you can't talk about the redemption offered in Jesus without talking about his great love. 
Whether you're in church for a long time or maybe this is your first time to church, you're, you're likely familiar with the verse that gets said a lot, and it's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. We love this verse, and it's an important verse for us in our faith as followers of Jesus. And if you haven't put your faith yet in him, this is an important verse for you to know. And I want to focus in on that beginning part as it refers, I believe, to redemption. God so loves the world. God so loves you. God so loves me. If you maybe have never heard it before, Maybe you've had a bad experience with church. Maybe you have a bad perception of God. I want you to know today that God loves you. And John took it a step further. God so loves you. Maybe you're going through a storm right now. Maybe you're facing a temptation. Maybe you're going through something difficult right now, and it's kind of clouded God for you. Maybe it made you feel like God doesn't love you, but I'm here today to remind you that God not only loves you, God so loves you. He so loves you. In fact, the psalmist took it a step further as he was pondering on God and his greatness and and how awesome he is. He said, God, you formed me. You put me together. You knit me together in my mother's womb. That's intentional. And God is intentional with you. God formed you in your mother's womb because he loves you. And this existed from the beginning. If you've ever read Genesis before, in Genesis we read, in the beginning God created, and he created the heavens, and he created the earth, and and he created the birds, and he created the fish, and he created the plants, and then he made his favorite, or I believe it's his favorite creation, he made humanity. And I think we're his favorite creation because unlike the rest of creation, there's some things that cause us to stand out when God created us. Number one, we're created in his image and likeness. And then number two, the very breath of God is what gave us life. The very breath of God is what sustains you today. God so loves you and this existed from the beginning. In fact, God created us that we might be in relationship with him, that we might do this life with him, and that we might rule the earth with him. He wanted this to be a relationship between us and him. But in the beginning, sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve disobeyed, and in case you didn't know it, that's what sin is. Sin is disobedience toward God. It's us saying, I'm going to do what I want. It's us saying, I'm going to do what I feel like, even if it goes contrary to whatever God says. That's what Adam and Eve did. Sin entered the world, and it created a problem. It created a barrier between us and God and the relationship he wanted to have with us. And the only payment for that sin, the Bible says, was our death. The only way that we could be freed from the power of sin was us paying for it by us dying. But if we died in our sin, we died eternally separated from God in hell. But God so loved the world that even in the beginning, if you read in Genesis, he had a plan for Jesus. He had a plan for a savior that would come. And in the Old Testament, there was what I call a temporary fix. There was the animal sacrifices and they would sacrifice an animal each time there was a sin so that that sin could be covered. But it never defeated the power of sin. And how many are thankful we don't have to do animal sacrifices anymore? I'm so grateful for that, right? But there were animal sacrifices in that time. It did not defeat the power of sin. And God started pointing to a savior, a Messiah that would come and not only cover your sin, not only only cleanse you of your sin, but also defeat the power of sin in your life and in my life. Because we inherited it from Adam to us, we inherited sinful nature, but God had a plan. In the Old Testament, through prophets, he started pointing, a Messiah's coming, a Messiah's coming. And one of the prophets that I believe he used to also point to a Messiah, and he also used prophets to, to represent him before the people. They would give the messages of God to the people. They would also tell and show of God's great love. He would exemplify it through them. There was a guy named Hosea in the Old Testament. And Hosea was a prophet of God, and he's just getting started. And remember, he's a man of God, and God one day speaks to him and says, Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute. Can you imagine hearing those words from God? 
Like, what are you talking about? I would tell you what's going through my mind. What is, what, what's it going to do to the image, the image I have as a man of God in front of the people? But remember, anything that God does, there's a reason behind it. There's an example he wants to give. There's a lesson to be learned. He says, Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute. So Hosea does it, and he finds a prostitute. He marries her. Her name is Gomer, and they get married, and things seem to be going well. Marriage seems to be going well, and in fact, they have three kids together. Three kids Things seem to be going well till one day Hosea wakes up and Gomer is no longer there. His wife is no longer there, meaning that now she's gone back to the life she used to live. She's gone back to prostitution. The Bible says she was being an adulteress with other men. And of course, the, co- the story could have stopped there. It could have been that Hosea then, man, you don't want anything to do with me. I don't want anything to do with you. You don't want to be in this marriage relationship. You want to go back to what you used to do. I don't want you anyways. But God refuses to let the story stop there. And he speaks to Hosea. He speaks to Hosea in chapter 3 of Hosea. And in verse 1, he says to him, go and love your wife again. She's gone. She's being an adulteress with other people. That's what the verse says. And he says to her, go and love, that says to him, go and love your wife again. What is he telling him? Go and find her. Go and bring her home and renew your vows to her. Love her again. Can you imagine how that felt? At the moment, he's on his own. He's a single dad. He's been abandoned, likely has has had emotion for her. She's abandoned him, and God says, go back. Go find her and love her again. Even though that she's adult being with somebody else right now, this is going to illustrate my love for my people. This is going to illustrate my love in the big picture for humanity. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we wanted nothing to do with God, Christ died for us. We were running from him. Some of you are running today. Maybe some of you are here because a friend kind of dragged you here, told you you were going to brunch, but brunch is after church. They tricked you. (laughs) You're here. And you want nothing to do with God. We've wanted nothing to do with God. And God says, I love you. And he demonstrates it through Hosea. And so Hosea, can you imagine how he felt? He went and he's looking for her and he's searching for her. And the Bible says he bought her back, which can mean a number of different things. It could mean he walked into an auction where his wife was being sold. It could mean that he walked into a place where his wife now had an owner. And he paid 15 pieces of silver, a couple of bushels of barley, and some wine to get his wife back. You know, the Bible says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness of their, uh, the fullness thereof. We're God's creation, yet when we sinned, We came under the power of sin, and God paid to get us back. We were already his, but he paid to get us back. And the Bible says through Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19, he says, you, were, you know that you weren't, it was not with perishable things like silver or gold that you were redeemed. You know that it was never money that could fix your relationship with God is what Peter's saying. You know that it was never your church attendance that could fix your relationship. You know what, it was never the amount of good things that you could ever do that could fix your relationship. What does Peter say? Redeemed us. The precious blood of Christ. What can wash away? my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus there was one way and one way alone that we could be bought back from the power of sin and Jesus volunteered because of the amazing love of God to put on skin and bones and come and be the sacrifice for our sins he paid it all So God uses as an example, and if you realize this story, Hosea represents God. And Gomer, that's me and you. That's me and you. Wanting to do nothing with God, and even at times when we come into a relationship with God, how many know that sometimes our past or the enemy comes calling? He's wanting to get us. Hosea represents God and Gomer represents you and me. So what's our response to Jesus, our loving redeemer? What's our response? Surrender. Give your life to him. Have you surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior over your life? 
Maybe you've been waiting for the perfect moment. Maybe you've been saying, I'll have a little more fun. I've got to just do these couple of things. I'll make this happen in my life, and then I'll surrender. Do you know that we are not promised tomorrow? And even as good as the life you think you have now, I promise you, life without Christ is not life. And like Gomer, I've got to imagine that like Gomer, you're starting to realize that the things that you're turning to for satisfaction, that the things that you're turning to for peace, be that a person, be that money, be that drugs, be that addiction, whatever it might be that we're trying to turn to for peace, there's only satisfaction in Jesus. There's only healing in Jesus. There's only redemption in Jesus. There's only forgiveness of sins in Jesus. What's my proper response to Jesus, our loving redeemer? Surrender. Surrender, Jesus. I give you my heart and my life. I'm following you as Savior, and next week we'll talk about following him as Lord, because he is Savior, but he's also our Lord. Jesus, our loving Redeemer, but then what about the people that, that are redeemed? What about the people that have given their hearts to Jesus? The second thought for you today is Jesus is still working in the redeemed. Jesus is still working in the redeemed, and I want to remind someone today that the work of Christ does not stop because you said yes to him. We were so honored to have so many people and in awe of so many people that filled these altars last week and have filled these altars these last couple of months saying yes to Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful thing to see people come forward and say that they're surrendering to Jesus? And that moment to me is like something I wanna illustrate for you today. And a lot of you, especially if you're a parent, you'll likely recognize what this box is because as for me and Bree as parents, we have a love and hate relationship with Legos. I don't know if you can see it where you're at. I'll tell you what they are, they're Legos. We have a love-hate relationship with these things because we like to do them, we find them relaxing, but man, our kids leave them everywhere and we tend to step on them. Any parents in the room, like amen, right? Um, but I brought this today to illustrate what I feel like it's like when we get when we say yes to Jesus. When we say yes to Jesus, yes to Jesus as Savior, yes to Jesus as Redeemer, doesn't it feel like he hands us a new life? Here's a new life for you. And we look at the picture on the new life, and maybe it's a, a picture that your pastor has painted for you, or, or maybe it's something that another Christian has told you, or maybe it's something that you read in the Bible about the life of a believer, and maybe even the life that God has for you for you to walk in. And isn't this a beautiful thing, what it's supposed to turn out to be? But how many of you know that in this box right now, this thing right here is not put together? The, the cover says that there's 355 pieces lying in here waiting to be this. And some of us feel, okay, God hands this to me, and now his work is done. Thank you, David, for saying yes. Here's a new life. I'll see you at the finish line. Make it happen. That's how some of us feel about the new life that we've been given. I've got to put that together. Are there instructions? And there is. How many know there's the word of God? But some of us feel like we're meant to do it on our own. We're meant to put this together on our own. And I want to remind somebody today, this was never meant to be a solo project. This is a father-son, father-daughter project. He wants to put this together with you. His work doesn't stop. Because you simply said yes. I remember walking up to my, uh, uh, walking to my son's room one day because he was kind of quiet and he was working on Legos. And he is crying his eyes out because he cannot figure out how to put it together. But then I sat with him and we're laughing and we're talking. There were still some moments of frustration when we couldn't figure out a certain piece and where it could go. But it built a bond between he and I and it created something beautiful. God has written a story for your life, a story of the redeemed, and he never intended for you to do this on your own, and, and maybe you're wondering today, well, how am I supposed to do it? Hebrews 12, verses one through two reminds us, therefore, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, people that have gone before us in the faith, man, let us, let us lay aside every way. Can I tell you today that as a follower of Jesus, life will still happen, that represents the weights. There are things that will still come your way, Life will still happen, difficulties, bad news, it'll still happen. He says, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares. If you haven't already experienced it, the enemy is still out to steal, kill, and destroy you. He's not, he's not happy about you giving your life to Jesus. So what does he say? Let us lay those things aside and run the race with endurance. Doesn't that sound great? And it's really fun to say, but how many of you have ever read that and you're in the thick of it and you think, how? 
How do I do that? How do I, lay, how do I turn my emotions off? How do I combat this feeling of temptation that seems so hard to overcome? And he gives us the answer in the next verse. Looking unto Jesus. He doesn't say looking to your own strength, looking to your own self-discipline, trying to do it on your own. He says looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith. He started this. You best believe he's going to see it through in your life if you'll just find a way to fix your eyes on him. And it says that he's at the right hand of God. I love that he included that because Romans 8.34 sheds some light into what he's doing at the right hand of God. And the Bible says that Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord, you know what he's at the right hand of God doing? He's interceding for you. He's praying for you. He's calling out to the Heavenly Father for you. Jesus is still thinking about you because he so loves you. How do I do this? How do I live this life? How do I put this life together? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the word. Come to church. Do the practical things that will bring life to you to help you focus your eyes on him. And you know the greatest thing of it all, or the greatest reminder, I think, we won't always get it right. I don't know if you've ever done one of these and put a wrong piece where it doesn't belong kind of messed up and then you get through and you're like, I got to tear this whole thing down just to fix that one little piece. You may mess up one day. You may be here and maybe you've blown it. Maybe you've walked away from God. Maybe you've sinned. You're struggling with something and man, you desperately want to get over it, but you just can't seem to do it. Maybe you're here today and life just seems to be weighing on you. You're going through something really difficult. Maybe you're even doubting God. Maybe you're angry with God. Can I encourage you today and remind you, God has not stopped being Hosea. And you may feel distant from him, you may have run from him, and everything inside you is screaming and telling you, stay away, he doesn't want anything to do with you anymore. He's forgotten about you. He doesn't care. You're gonna struggle with this forever. God's ashamed of you right now. Don't go near to him, he won't hear you, he won't hear a prayer. God has not stopped being Hosea. He's not stopped going to the streets looking for you. He's not stopped being the prodigal, the father of the prodigal son. You know the Bible says in that story that the dad was waiting, watching, hoping for him to come home. And when he just got a glimpse of his son, you know what he did? He ran to him. God is waiting for you to just get in in eyesight with him so he can run to you and wrap you in his arms and pick up right where you left off. Jesus has not stopped working in the redeemed. Jesus wants to keep working in you. And Colossians tells us that because, and this is what Paul I think is trying to remind the Colossians, because of the price that Jesus paid for redemption, you've been transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his son. Do you know that word means the authority of darkness? I think he's reminding him, no matter how you feel, no matter how tempted, no matter how much struggles you're going through, I want to remind you, Satan has no authority over you. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. He has no authority over your life. He has no authority. He's transferred you from the kingdom of darkness, the authority of darkness, to the kingdom of his son. Can I tell you today that as people of the kingdom of his son, there are benefits that come with being part of the kingdom of his son. You have the spirit of God in you. How many know that the word of God says great, that the greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world? And that's referring to the spirit inside you. But the Bible also says that it's not by might and it's not by power, but by my spirit. You know that through the Spirit of God and you receive the Spirit of God when you give your heart to Jesus, through the Spirit of God, you can live for Jesus. Through the Spirit of God, you can represent Jesus. Through the Spirit of God, you can be a witness to every single person and conquer everything that the enemy would love to throw at you. You have the Spirit of God inside you. You have all that you need. You have all that you need. As a child of the living King, you have a family that loves you. Don't do this life alone. 
Link arms with the people that are here with you. Don't try to face this on your own. The enemy would love for you to face this on your own. Find people here at this church, in this church family that'll do life with you. And then don't forget the blessings that he gives us. And we have the blessings because we have Jesus. And he tells us that we'll be blessed going in and blessed going out, that an enemy may rise up against us, but they'll be defeated right in front of us. The enemies may come one direction, but they gotta flee in seven different directions. That will be the head and not the tail, the top and never the bottom. Those are the promises of scripture. That's who you are. The enemy would love for you to forget that you are a child of God. Don't let him. This is who you are. You're not your mistakes and you're not your past and you're not what the enemy would like your future to be. You are who God says you are, a child of the living King, called and anointed. You are his. So Jesus, our loving redeemer, Jesus is still working in the redeemed. And then Jesus working through the redeemed. And we close with this, reminding you that your story has power. If you've given your heart to him, your story has power. Psalm 107 verse two, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. And some of you said the older version that I know, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those that have been redeemed from the hand of the foe, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Jesus rescued you from something and you know now he wants to rescue others through you. He does, and, and, and this goes right along with what we say all the time. We want you to go to growth track. We want you to get plugged in on a team. We want you to get in a group. We want all of those things. But we also want that outside of this building, as you're part of your everyday lives, that you would find opportunities to share what Jesus has done. And I know the nervousness that you could feel. Am I gonna say it right? It's your story. I'm pretty sure you're gonna be able to say it right. Am I gonna mess something up? Yeah, you might along the way, but that's how you learn. Nobody is just perfect at just sharing the gospel. That's how we learn. But we got to start somewhere. And Jesus is wanting to work through you. And your story has power. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they defeated him, being the enemy, by the blood of the lamb, the redemption of Jesus, what Jesus did for us, and what? The word of their testimony. By their testimony, your story has power. Your life transformed by Jesus, meaning the everyday actions, the way that I speak, the way that I treat my neighbor, the way that I work at the job, even if I don't like it, that's part of your testimony that represents and defeats the enemy. But then you actually opening up your mouth and saying, hey, can I tell you what Jesus has done for my life? It defeats the enemy. It defeats the enemy. Jesus is coming soon and the harvest is plenty. There's so many out there that are needing Christ, that are needing redemption, that are needing what you have. And God is waiting for you to open your mouth and tell your story. Jesus, our loving redeemer, Jesus is still working in the redeemed. And Jesus wants to work through you, his redeemed, his redeemed. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish up our time together today. And I want you to take a moment and I want you to ask God yourself, what are you saying to me? What are you speaking to me? And I want to end our time together by asking you a question. Do you need to encounter the Redeemer today? Do you need to encounter the Redeemer today. Maybe you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus. This is your moment. Don't put it off any longer. Jesus came and paid the price for your sins to offer you new life. And all you have to do today to receive this new life is to put your faith and trust in him. Life can start anew, and I'm not saying it'll be perfect because there'll still be weights, there'll still be life, and there'll still be the temptation of sin, but nothing compares to walking through this life with Jesus. Don't run any longer, don't put it off any longer. If you're here today and I'm speaking to you, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and say, yes, David, I want to say yes to Jesus. If that's you today on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And you're not doing that for me and you're not doing it for the people around you. This is more a symbolic act that's God, I'm, I'm acknowledging my need for you.
If I'm speaking to you today on the count of three, you wanna say yes to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. If that's you, I want you to get your hand up. Come on, don't be shy about it. If that's you, you know I need to say yes to Jesus. Come on, there's hands up all across this room. Can we give God praise for all the yeses in the room today? Amen. Amen. Those that raise your hand, I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer today. You're gonna make this your prayer though, because I believe in your heart, you have acknowledged your need for him. And now I'm just gonna help you put some words to it, but make it your own. I'm gonna ask everybody to pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And thank you for speaking to me. I know today that you love me. I know today that you died for my sins. I need you. I say yes to you. God, come today and give me new life. Forgive me of my sins and help me to never be the same again. I love you and I praise you and I thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and let's throw a party for the people that said yes to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray with another group of people before I move on to that other group. Those of you that raised your hand, made a decision to follow Jesus, I want you to, I wanna ask you to do me, I wanna ask you for a favor. If you could please either text commit to 94,000 or the connect card in front of you, grab it, fill it out, and you're gonna mark down, I made a decision to follow Jesus, or if you rededicated your life, you can mark that down. This is just a digital version of that. Do that before you go, and the reason being, we wanna get in touch with you. This is a journey, and we don't want you to do it on your, long, on your own. We wanna walk this life with you. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet today. The other group of people, if you're here today and you need to refix your eyes on Jesus, maybe you've been struggling with the weights of life, maybe you've been struggling with the temptation of sin, maybe there's just something that you can't shake, or maybe you need the courage to share your story. This is your moment in the quiet of your heart to pray to God and say either get right, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin, I'm sorry for what I've been struggling with. I fix my eyes on you. Lord, help me with the weight of life. God, help me to have courage. Would you take a moment? And whatever it is, wherever you're at, I want you to pray to him right now. You can take this moment. God hears your prayers. What did God speak to you today? This is your moment to respond. This is your moment to say yes. This is your moment. I'm asking that nobody move. Pastor Javi's just gonna lead us in a simple chorus. And I thought we could finish up our time singing this and then in prayer. But as we sing this out, can we do it with gratitude for the redemption that Jesus has given us through his blood, through his sacrifice. Pastor Javi, would you lead us today?
Father, we are so grateful for Jesus. Lord, everyone in this room has a story, and I pray that by your word today, you spoke to their story, you spoke to their hearts, you spoke to the season of life they find themselves in. And Lord, whatever you reveal to them today, whatever you spoke to them today, may they say yes to you. We fix our eyes on Jesus, our Redeemer. Thank you for your love, almighty God, that sent Jesus to the cross, brought us back from the power of sin, and has given us all that we need to live this life for you. I pray your blessing over your people today, that you would watch over their going and their coming. Every decision that they make, every place that they go, may they remember they are carriers of your presence. And everywhere they go, may they tell the story of how you have redeemed them. Father, may the redeemed of the Lord say so. God, I pray your blessing, your protection, your watchful eye over them. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, church one more time can we give our redeemer all the honor all the glory and all the praise new life we love you so much if you're heading to growth track or to your group god bless you stop by get a cup of coffee fellowship with each other and we will see you next week god bless you Thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, we're so glad you could join us for another incredible service. Yeah, and before you go, we just wanted to quickly remind you to stay connected with us during the week. Yeah, you could do that by following us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram. And take time to download our app. Just search for New Life Lehigh. Yeah, and if today you committed your life to Christ, we want to say first and foremost, we are so happy for you and so proud of you. Make sure you just shoot us a text at 94,000 and say commit, and we'll be right there with your next steps. Yeah, and if you're watching and you're looking for ways to get involved and serve in our church community, we have an awesome opportunity called Growth Track. At Growth Track, you can learn so much about New Life and your giftings and how you can serve right here at New Life. Yeah, and that may be helping out with events with our dream team or joining a small group, whatever it is, we just love to have you on board. Yeah, thanks again for tuning in. We wanna invite you to tune in next week at 9.15 and 11.15 once more. Have an incredible week.